Council mem the council meeting on October 20th, 2020 is called to order. How about we have Mr. Eric Onisco do the pledge? I pledge of allegiance to the flag, to the flag United States of America, America and, and to, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. I didn't hear anybody else. <laughs> I was saying it. Yep. I it really was loud, but I was on mute. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, Donna, will you please do the roll call? Yes, I will. What time did we call it to order? 6.08? 6.07 or 8, yeah. So I'll say 6.07. Okay, roll call. Council Member Inesco? Here. Mayor Dorsey? Here. Council Member Feast? Here. Council Member McDowell? Present. Council Member Bode? Here. Deputy Mayor Peterson? Here. Council Member Schmitz? Still here. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Thank you. Does Council have any uh, changes to the agenda and or Jeff? Uh, Mr. Mayor, Deputy Mayor, and Council, I do have uh, one late addition, and that is will be under uh, Section D presentations, and we'd like to add item two to that for Mr. V. Miller to uh, tell us about our bond refunding experience. Yay! <laughs> All right. At this time, I'd like to remind members that they can make comments during the public comment period as well as a business and action agenda. Option one, join the Zoom meeting by clicking on the link that is displayed on the city's web page. The link is listed on the agendas and minutes page under the tab that says more. Option two, email city manager Jeff Knighton. And option three, call Jeff's office phone. Both email address and phone numbers are displayed on the screen of Mason Web TV streaming video. All right. On the consent agenda. Agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as published? I move to approve the consent agenda as published. All right. Do we have a second? I second it. All right. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Yeah. Yeah. All opposed? No? Okay, motion carries. All right. Donna, do we have anyone interested in making a public comment tonight? No, Mr. Mayor, we don't have anyone signed up. Okay. Next on the agenda is a presentation from our Public Works Department Superintendent, Mike Albaugh, and Water Quality Specialist, Ken Dickinson, are going to share information with us about the Cross Connection Program. <laughs> Start speaking. Go ahead, Mike. Are we there? How are we doing? Which one? We're doing good. Wonderful. Well, I have Ken Dickinson, our water quality specialist here, and I tasked Ken and the water department to put together a cross connection program overview. This was direction from Jay, so we could give basically the public and um, you all as well um, an understanding of what a cross connection program actually is. So right now, I'm going to turn it over to Ken Dickinson our water quality specialist, just to go through the PowerPoint with you. Hi, my name's Ken Dickinson. Been with the city for 32 years. Yay! <laughs> um, so this is the PowerPoint. Um, we actually, it is a state WAC that we have a cross-connection program. And the WAC number you can see right there is 246-290-490. Um, you basically have two types of cross connection. There's an actual cross connection and a potential, and that's where a lot of people um, get confused uh, because potentially we have to protect our water system also. Um, so, and this this is all on uh, the drinking water side um, that uh, backflow has to go on. Um, 
couple of the big um, um, irrigation systems in residential are uh, uh, is one of the big uh, cross connections um, in residential. Um, to protect that, uh, it's the backflow is called a double check valve assembly, um, and they are you're able to put those in a vault in the ground. Um, restaurants, and I just brought some of these up. Uh, restaurants, for instance, um, beverage dispenser is a big one. Um, those need uh, protection, which is called a RPBA, which is a re, um, reduced pressure backflow assembly. Um, be beverage uh, dispensers can be very hazardous. Um, chemicals within um, the CO2 and the copper tubing um, do not mix and they can be very dangerous. Um, so um, you have to have a backflow assembly on those. And th there's a couple other ones there that you can, that also need protection. <clears throat> Again, the, the WAC number is on here. Um, we do have a cross connection policy and a, and a cross connection plan. Um, the um, cross, cross connection policy, it's in the municipal section of 15.08.080. And also that comes along with this, um, there can be penalties. Um, a violation can be $2,000 for the violation and 2,000 additional for each day thereafter. Here is what the state health department, and this isn't everything on this um, table nine is what the state health department calls table nine. Um, there is a, 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 a lot more that could go on this. I just put a few of them down. Um, all car washes, uh, we don't have any chemical plants or anything. We do have uh, commercial laundry and dry cleaning. These all have to have what they call the RPBA, a reduced pressure backflow assembly. Um, even down here, the third one from the bottom, surveys, access, denied or restricted. If I go into a place that is that needs a survey that to be done, and for instance, there's a closet off to the side that has a door. If I'm denied going into that closet, the survey is done and it's an automatic RPBA that is put on to our water system by the cust customer. It's property owners that, that put this assembly on. Here's a... A picture, um, the one on the left, upper left, is a double check valve assembly. Um, the lower right one is the reduced pressure backflow assembly. And the difference between the two, and I don't know if I, this pointer points to it or not, but the RPBA right down in the middle of that, you see that round um, assembly there on the bottom. Just to the right of that, these spill out water. If it, um, detects that there is a pressure difference in the in the line, it will start closing down the, the two check valves that are up on the upper top there, and it will start re, um, throwing out water. So the reduced pressure backflow assemblies have to be um, um, up, um, installed above ground in what they call a hot box. And there will be another picture here coming up. I believe it's the next slide that we can show you that. This is uh, the slide from McDonald's. I took this because it's one of the newer um, business that, that's been put in town. What you see there on the left is a reduced pressure backflow assembly. Um, and, and the box that it's in is called a hot box. Um, we have to keep these assemblies from freezing from being vandalized. Um, and it's all property owners when, when this is installed, 
um, the responsibility to do this, but it is part of the WAC that it says that they have to be kept from being flooded, vandalized, kept, kept from freezing from, from the weather. The uh, one in the green box there is, is a double check also from McDonald's, and that is for irrigation. And, and you can see there the difference, like I said earlier, the double check can be put in a little vault, depending on how big it is, um, to be protected. So it, it's in ground, you don't need anything um, from up above it. So the main thing on that one, on the double check, you don't want it to have any flooding water getting in, into the box. Uh, the, this slide here is also in a, in a vault and it's a little bigger. Um, this is probably, I, I believe this is a three inch uh, double check. This is actually what they call a double check detector because just to the bottom of the, of the screen there that you can see there's a little meter right there, it's a water meter. And that's to detect how much water is going through that assembly. Um, but this one here is out, is uh, in, the, in the vault and it is protected for the um, fire protection within McDonald's. You have two types of uh, cross connections uh, um, hazards. You have a low cross connection hazard and a high cross connection hazard. The low hazard is what you put a double check uh, valve assembly on. The high hazard, you have to have either an air gap or an RPBA. Uh, doing a survey for businesses, um, what we're going to start doing is um, going through businesses. Um, every business in, in town needs to be done at least once a year. Um, if there is, like I said, um, we will try to get hold of the property owner to ask them that a survey needs to be done. And uh, if we can't get a hold of anybody, then we send out a, a three part letter stating that a survey will be done and we are trying to contact them and they would also have the information that they can contact me um, as, a, as a cross connection specialist. And I think that's an important part, Ken, as far as you're, you're out there willing to help, you know, yes. to answer questions. It's just not this big authority thing. It, it's very important because you're dealing with, I mean, this is, this is a public water system. So, I mean, it's public health you're dealing with. So, but we're out there to help to answer questions, to aid and assist in any way. Yeah. And if we can get rid of a cross, cross connection where the people don't need it, we will, we will work with them trying to get eliminate that cross connection also. Um, residential, um, it states in the WAC that they are to be done at least once every five years. <clears throat> um, I've been told or, or read an article that um, some people are putting these on um, would be, I guess it'd be the internet or on our public on our website, the city website, and they could get a um, and fill that questionnaire out on the website. Um, hopefully, we can work that out. We don't have that right now, but hopefully, that we can work that out where that could happen. Um, and also, again, if we can't get a hold of the residents. And that is also the resident and the property owner, basically for both of them, a letter would go out um, telling them that a survey needs to be done. So here's a little message I, um, that I wrote up quite a few years ago. Uh, the city of Shelton is working hard to ensure that the water system is safe for everyone to use and drink. If the cross connection exists at your home or business, you may need a backflow assembly. Someone from our cross connection program can visit and assess your property in order to assist you with this important issue. A properly installed backflow assembly will protect you, your family, neighbors, friends, and city and the city water system. 
let's keep everybody safe. And that is down at the bottom is my um, phone number down at the, my uh, desk down at the shop. So anybody have any questions? No questions. Stop sharing. Have we ever had a uh, a situation where the the uh, like a resident or a business didn't have double backflow prevention or backflow prevention, and it actually resulted in um, a loss in water pressure and and contamination to our water supply in your time? Because you got you've only been here a couple of years. I'm not sure. <laughs> no, as far as I know. Um, as long as I've been here, there has never been a backflow situation. Um, we have gone into some uh, um, businesses where they do need some backflow, um, and they're, they're, people aren't very happy when you, they can't get rid of the, the problem, and you tell them that they have to put a backflow assembly on, and uh, that, that's been the problem in the past. So. Um, but like I said, businesses, at least once a year, all your high hazard businesses need to be done. Um, and then residential all needs to be done at least once every five years. So but, I'll just yeah. add, I'm, and I was just gonna say, and I'm, I'm, I'm reasonably confident it's because of the, the diligence and the care that you put into this over the last 30 years plus. So, and thank you for your, your service to the city as well. Uh, thank you. Also, I forgot to mention within the, um, I have a program down at the shop on my computer. It's called XC2. Um, it tracks all the testing of these backflow assemblies. It, it tracks all the um, surveys that will be done. Um, and it will alert you when um, another survey on the property that needs to be done. Um, and so it's, it's all done on this backflow program that the city has paid for. And we just got that upgraded to a, uh, the XC2, which is a better program that we, from what we've had before. Dan? <clears throat> yes. I have a question. Um, I always get my little letter from you. Every yes. Year. Well, residential, you just said could be five years. Why, why, do, why are we doing it every year at my house? No, that's, that's the testing. The testing of these backflow assemblies have to be done every year. I see, okay. But the survey only has to be done on residential once every five years. Okay. But, but yeah, the testing, we have uh, right now between 650 to 700 backflow assemblies within the city of Shelton right now, and every one of them have to be tested every year. Right. And, the, and the people get a reminder at the, at the if you're, and I can't remember what month yours are in, but just say it was due in April. Mm -hmm. um, the first part of April, the letters go out uh, on the 27th of, uh, that would be the 27th of March. So you have it close to the April 1st. Yeah. Um, and everybody, we, we test, um, from March clear to October. So everybody that within those months um, get a letter at the start of the month. And then if they don't get that tested, following the next month, they get a second notice <laughs> and so on. They get a total up to three notices. Yeah, I've got that second notice before from you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. What happens if they don't respond? If they don't respond within that third notice, um, within the WAC, it states that we can shut the water off. Um, again, there's fines in there. Um, they can be charged the $2,000 per day fine. Um, but most of the time, once we get the water off and we lock the meter off also along with that, it's, it's within hours before everybody gets that fixed. Yeah. Well, thank you. Anybody else? I just want to say something about Ken. Um, he, this is one of the last things Kenny wanted to implement in this program. When he, he started as a cross connection specialist, he hit the ground running and probably has more passion 
in this position than any other position I can think of down at the city. He really paid attention to detail and there was a want to get this program started and actually implement it the right way, not just halfway. So, I mean, Kenny, you got almost 32 years in, you've been a great worker to work with and supervise. You, anytime we call you, you come in, you're plowing snow if need be, your information that you have banked in your head around a sewer or storm system or anything like that. I mean, you always have the answers, you always have, and it's been a pleasure to work with you. So we just wanna give you this certificate of retirement as a gesture. So we appreciate it, Kenny. Everything you've done, 32 years, buddy. Uh, thank you, thank you. So when's your last day? Uh, October 30th. October 30th. Last day. Wow. Congratulations. Good for you, Kenny. Uh, congratulations. Congrats. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. Welcome. Recessing from our regular meeting. And Mr. Oh, Mayor, remember? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Aaron B. Miller. Oh, yeah. Well, that's on the after the uh, reg to after the recess, isn't it? Uh, no, this is the second part of the, uh, uh, oh. pres this is the second presentation for uh, Director B. Miller to talk to us about the bond refunding process. All right. Mr. B. Miller, you're up. Uh, thank you. Let me just share my screen here. Uh, hopefully everybody can see um, the PowerPoint. Is that... Um, so, uh, as part of the ordinance that the uh, council approved in order for us to do the bond refunding, uh, one of the requirements was for me to come back at the earliest reasonable uh, time to um, inform the council on whether we were or were not able to stay within the parameters that were set in the ordinance. Um, I won't spend a lot of time on this, we've been over this. Uh, but pre-bond sale, just some of the key considerations that we went through is that we wanted to issue the bonds prior to the November elections uh, to hopefully achieve a higher savings due to lower rates. Um, historically, rates rise after the election. Uh, we began this process in early August when rates were at their all-time low, and from that period forward, they slowly crept up the slowly crept up the scale. And um, as early as October, we were estimating about a $2.3 million uh, savings over the life of the bonds. Um, some of the things that we did is we approved the use of bond insurance to help with rates and savings. Uh, so that went into uh, the process. We also provided $240,000, $239,000 in debt reserves for the Department of Ecology loans to buy down the refunding principal. And so those were by contract reserves that we had to have um, on uh, on our books um, to uh, to back the debt um, um, payments. And so we went ahead and added those and um, into uh, the refunding to again buy down the principal amount. And then we've contracted with U.S. Bank to make payoff payments on the refunded bonds. Um, they know what they're doing. They're very professional about it, and it didn't cost us very much. And they'll make sure that the uh, bond revenues get to the proper proper person, proper place at the proper time. So the bond sale itself, it took place on October 14th as scheduled and it was highly successful. <clears throat> In total, um, we were about three times oversubscribed. And what that means is there are more people that wanted to buy our bonds than we had available. And um, as a result, it allowed our underwriters and financial advisors to make some alt, um, alterations to maximize savings. And that's um, what we were able to do. We were able to increase uh, rates on some of, the, some of the bonds and some of the maturities that weren't selling well, and we were able to decrease rates on those that were oversubscribed. So all in all, very successful. Total savings is about $3,050,000. Uh, and on all of the bonds, we were able to move the longer maturities from 2052 to 2047. So we we're able to shave 
a lot of time off the debt repayment as as well. So that was um, another uh, nice nice um, happening there. Um, officially, the bond process will close on the 28th. Um, so the sale parameters report. Uh, we had to ensure that the aggregate principal amount of the refunded bonds cannot exceed $10 million. That's true. We, the refunded uh, bonds par amount is $8,860,000. So that's the amount that will go against the LTGO um, councilmatic bond um, that we've discussed uh, prior. Uh, the final maturity of the bonds cannot extend beyond 2052. Uh, it's uh, now at 2047, so we checked that box. Um, the aggregate purchase price of the bonds cannot exceed, cannot be less than 95% or greater than 135% of the aggregate stated principal. Uh, the aggregate purchase price is 106.7%, so we stayed within that parameter. The true interest cost of the bonds cannot exceed 4%. We are at 2.14% there, and the bonds are sold for a price that results in a net present value savings of at least 3%, and we were able to save 18.43%. So we were um, able to stay within all of our parameters. Um, again, just to kind of wrap up, very successful bond uh, process. Um, and sale, uh, you know, nice to have the A-plus rating affirmed by Standard & Poor's. Um, it's also with a stable outlook. Um, uh, the savings on the bond was higher than expected. That's always a, a nice surprise. And uh, we were able to shave those five years off of our debt service. And just want to recognize, again, the team of uh, Justin Monway. He's our Justin Monway. He's our financial advisor at Piper Sandler. Deanna Gregory is our bond counsel at Pacifica. And Caitlin... Caldwell is our underwriter at KeyBank Capital Markets. And then I also want to just uh, recognize all of the work that Terry did, um, our own Terry Schnitzer, in order to prepare uh, the information for the official statement. So really successful um, process and uh, glad that we were, we were able to go through it. So unless there's questions, I just wanted to provide that updated report. Yes. That's really, really great, Aaron. I saw Joe nodding his head the whole time. So, <laughs> yeah, can, congrats on that, and uh, you know, just the continued um, professionalism and strong organization from the top down. It's it's great to see the things that are happening, and appreciate everyone's effort on the finance team. Great, thank you. I'll pass that on. Yeah, please do. All right, now. We are recessing from our regular meeting to open a public hearing about considering the 2021 ad valorem and EMS levy. Mr. B. Miller, who's had a busy night, has details for us about an ordinance to consider the 2021 ad valorem and EMS levies. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor. Um, the ordinance before you is the 2021 regular and EMS ad valorem taxes. Uh, similar to the discussion at the SMPD meeting, um, this ordinance uh, sets the uh, levies, the regular levy and the EMS levy for collections in 2021 at 1%. State law, um, uh, we're allowed to increase revenues from previous years by 1% or the implicit price deflator, uh, whichever is lower. And it came in, the, the IPD uh, came in at 0.6%. So um, um, it came in lower than our 1% that we have in this ordinance. Um, by RCW, we can increase our property tax collections to the full 1%. Uh, with the passage of a sub ordinance of su substantial need. Um, and that ordinance needs to be uh, approved uh, by a majority plus one. So five uh, council members in this case. Um, I did wanna just talk briefly about the um, ad valorem tax ordinance itself, um, similar to the conversation we had uh, earlier, a couple of Scribner um, changes that we had to make. Um, and these will be in the ordinance that comes back to you. Under section two, we, the ordinance that we originally had had uh, to be collected in 2020, um, an increase 
uh, of the EMS 2019 highest lawful levy for collections of 2020. So that should be the first date should be 2021 is authorized to be collected in 2021 with an increase to the EMS 2020 highest lawful levy of 1% for collections in 2021. So we just had, we had some wrong um, years in there. So those will be updated. Um, again, the ordinance, um, this ordinance will increase our levy amount by the full 1%. Neither the EMS levy nor the regular levy have bank property tax capacity. Um, it's at its highest um, amount now. So um, um, those aren't consideration. And one thing I, I did want to just add, we have not received the preliminary information from the um, Mason County Assessor's Office at this point in time. They are the ones that are, um, you know, calculate the um, uh, property tax, the assessed valuation. So we are using an estimated uh, new construction amount as well as an estimated state assessment amount. Um, those are the amounts from 2020. So we've just carried those forward. Um, if we get information that changes that, we'll try to pop those in before, um, before uh, the next time that this comes up. But if worse comes to worse, this will, this will get us to uh, a full 1% on last year's. And then with new construction, um, um, it, it equals the amount that we have uh, budgeted for 2021. So shouldn't be a problem from that, from that side of things. Um, so that's, that's what I have and happy to answer any questions on this. One, all right. Has anyone signed up for public testimony, Donna? No, we don't have anyone listed, Mr. Mayor. All right. I'd like to ask for the first reading of ordinance number 1953-0820. Ordinance number 1953-0820, an ordinance of the city of Shelton, Washington, setting the amount of the annual ad valorem taxes in the city of Shelton for calendar year 2021. All right. Do we have a motion? Anyone? We have no motion. Is this a business item? It is a business item. Oh, I'm sorry. Not a motion. Well, I asked yes, for a motion. It is. It's yeah, a motion. It is a motion. We are uh, going to start asking uh, for motions to move them forward, particularly on ordinances, um, so that we can keep the record straight. And the motion should be, or a suggested motion should be at the bottom of your uh, briefing sheet. Un understood on the suggested. I must have missed the memo that we were doing the motions in. Yeah. On business. So I move to forward the 2021 ad valorem tax ordinance to the November 17th council meeting for the scheduled second public hearing for further consideration and action and to allow the public another opportunity to be heard on the ordinance under consideration. Second. Right. And we have a second. Second. Council members have any questions? We have a motion and a second to move forward the 2021 ad valorem tax ordinance to the November 17th council meeting for the scheduled second public hearing for further consideration and action to allow the public another opportunity to be heard on the ordinance under consideration. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you people. Okay, this public hearing is closed and now we'll open another public hearing about the 2021 preliminary budget. We have another budget piece to consider. Aaron has the details. Uh, thank you again, Mayor. Um, the ordinance before you is our 2021 budget ordinance um, and it will set the annual appropriation for the city. Uh, the budget totals $31,676,380. Um, as we discussed earlier at the um, budget um, meeting, 
um, we are going to add about eighty thousand dollars to that for the sewer in training sewers technician in training position that we uh, don't have in the preliminary budget um, that that's before you right now. So this number will um, increase by about that eighty thousand um, dollars. The budget also includes a general fund appropriation of twelve million two hundred eighty three thousand nine hundred and twenty. Um, the appropriation uh, for operating uh, for operating expenses at the fund level uh, will lapse at the end of the year. Um, by RCW, uh, the ordinance also uh, includes a continuing appropriation for all all capital projects, so that those can uh, continue until they are completed, and no legislative action will need to be taken for um, for those costs to continue to be um, incurred uh, it, throughout the coming years unless they um, overspend the uh, budget amount. So the ordinance does have that in there as well. Um, the budget for 2021 must be adopted by the end of this calendar year. And on the ordinance itself, I just wanted to uh, demonstrate under section two, um, this is the continuing appropriation that uh, is required for um, our capital projects. Um, and then below in exhibit um, A and B give you um, the expenditure levels by fund as well as our, our estimated um, ending fund balance at the end of 2021 based on our estimates that we have right now. And the budget, uh, the proposed budget packet um, is um, included uh, by reference to this ordinance. So that's also um, included in, in the ordinance. So um, that's all I have, um, but happy to answer any questions that you might have. Aaron, we had a couple of questions from council members. Uh, I think we addressed a couple of them in the work session, but I didn't know if you wanted to go over a few of them, uh, a few of them now. Uh, I, cer I certainly can. Um, um, one of the questions that we had was um, what types of charges um, are included in our goods and services? Uh, it's a revenue source um, that we have. And um, I believe this question was mostly directed toward the general fund. Um, and those, uh, those things that we get revenues for, for goods and services include um, the, the police contract, the SRO police contract that, that we used to have, um, hopefully we'll come back. Parks and rec fees, um, that um, um, uh, alarm fees, all of those types of things where we provide a service for that plan review. Um, and significantly, a lot of that revenue is from indirect costs and where other funds pay the general fund for the services of finance department, the HR department, the IT department, and all of that kind of stuff. So those are um, um, kind of the, 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 types of, the types of revenues that go into um, goods and services. Um, another question that we had is, um, why don't we provide a 2021 tax, uh, or why don't we provide a three to five year uh, tax um, estimate uh, moving out three to five years? and. So with that, um, we just haven't gotten there yet, but the 10 year financial plan that we went over as part of the budget process, that will be included in the final budget. And so there will be, um, that piece will be added um, again, just as an estimate for what the future might, might bring for that. Um, had a question about the transfer out, what types of um, expenses are in transfers out? I think we might've um, touched on this one, but Transfer outs are payments that leave one fund that go into another fund to be expended. So in the general fund, um, one of our transfer outs is to the street fund. We provide uh, supplemental funding to the street fund. So the transfer out is, I think, budgeted at $570,000 in the general fund. That goes as revenue into the street fund. And then the street fund can use that revenue for their ongoing operations. And so those are the types of things. Debt service is, awfully, is often transferred from one fund into the bond debt fund in order to make those payments. So um, it's just a way of accounting uh, for some of those transfers. Um, 
there was a question on um, the uh, capital plan and it had a question of why was, uh, was, was there a correlation between the state biennium process in 24 and 26 to the plan capital expenditures and um, know that the planning in our CIP was just uh, an assumption of when things are going to need to be done, how much and how much they'll cost. Um, so again, it's just kind of an estimate, but it's not tied uh, particularly to a to the state um, um, uh, budget process. Um, had a question of the cargo van, um, um, and I believe the question is, uh, where is it going to be? Where is it being funded from? Um, which is the Capital Resources Fund is going to make a transfer so the cargo van can be bought. So we're buying the cargo van out of the Capital Resources Fund. Um, and then will it be placed on a replacement schedule? And will when will the system be in place for that process? And the answer to that is yes. And we're hoping next year. We had we had wanted to change our uh, EM and R fund into an ER and R and have that be citywide. Uh, uh, for vehicle and particular types of asset replacement. We did not get there with COVID um, and some of the other things that we were trying to get done this year, uh, but that is something that we really want to do um, and, and uh, to get that on there. So short answer to that is yes, we're working on it and it should be, we're working on that in every, um, every um, asset um, and, and vehicle and everything will be um, in that fund. Um, and, and with a determined replacement schedule uh, for that. Um, again, on the, on the CIP, there was a question about what is undefined funding gap mean? I think we talked about that a little bit um, for projects that we aren't, you know, we're making some guesstimates on some funding, but where we know that we have a, uh, an amount that has not been filled yet, we just, we put that down there and just to provide information to the council that, Here's where um, we don't have enough resources to cover um, those costs. Um, there's a question on the increase in professional services costs for um, information technology um, on page 46 of the budget. And, and it's an increase of $47,000. And it's really three things. It's We have $10,000 in there for server licenses, $26,000 for our contract with Wright Systems, and $11,000 for the Outlook 365 payments that we have to make. That increase of the 47,000 is offset by the reduction of one FTE. So um, um, there's still an overall reduction in IT of I think about 40, $45,000. Um, but that's what that 47 is comprised of. Um, there's a question on page 83. Um, uh, about the street cleaning and is that due to the new sweeper and uh, no what ended up um, back in 2020 we only had about $1,800 budgeted for that activity and when we were going through that with public works um, they were they needed a higher budget there because they're going to spend more this year they're estimating to spend about $15,000 the budget was only 1,000 so what we did is we increased um, salary costs. We moved that into that function. There's an equal offset reduction in other functions of that part of the budget, but that's what's really driving driving that um, that increase. There's trying to get the budget to be more in line with what they believe they will actually spend there. Um, and then we had a question about um, uh, increased budgets for travel. Um, especially in this time of COVID, um, um, what, what will happen if, um, you know, there are still uh, travel restrictions and trainings are not being put on. Uh, we wanted to, to put a budget in there that would be able to handle um, the travel and training requirements that we have if things improve from a COVID perspective. Um, if not, that, that budget won't get spent um, um, as, it's, as it's presented. And um, it will give, at least in some cases, an opportunity for more people to attend trainings because they're uh, virtual now. And so um, there's not the cost of travel and um, in there as much. Um, so those, 
we, we've put it in there so that we have we have the ability to do it should should it improve. Um, I think that's unless I'm missing one. I believe those were the questions that we received, and I'm happy to speak more on any of those points or or answer any other questions. All right. Thank you, Aaron. All right. Has anyone signed up for public testimony, Donna? No, they haven't, Mr. Mayor. All right. At this point, I ask for the first reading of ordinance number 1954-0820. Ordinance number 1954-0820 an ordinance of the city of Shelton, Washington, adopting the budget for the calendar year 2021. Okay. Again, we need a motion to move this forward. I move, and I hope I'm reading the right one because I've been going back and forth. <laughs> I move to forward the 2021 annual budget to the November 17th council meeting for the scheduled second public hearing to allow the public another opportunity to be heard on the budget under consideration. Mm -hmm. A second. 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 All right. Thank you, Joe. <laughs> was it Joe? Was it <laughs> Who was it? Who did that? That was Joe. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Any more questions or comments for Aaron? Just want to say thank you. Thanks for answering all my uh, detailed questions there. I really appreciate it. I figured if I studied it pretty hardcore, you know, you, you had to ask some or answer some questions, right? <laughs> all right, we have a you motion to pay and a taxes. second. Oops, sorry. We have a motion and a second to move forward the 2021 annual budget to the November 17th council meeting for the scheduled second public hearing to allow the public another opportunity to be heard on the budget under consideration. All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. This public hearing is closed and we will resume the regular meeting. All right. Okay. Now we have a resolution regarding APS, APSCO Sole Source. Public Works Director Jay Harris will share the details. Good evening, Mayor, Council, Jay Harris, your Public Works Director. Um, we're going to top main wastewater treatment plant. So at the plant, which I don't know if all of you have had a tour of, of the main plant or the membrane plant, but um, if not, uh, I, I call me and uh, I'll get you out around to show you some of these facilities if you're interested. But the main plant, we have oxidation ditches. What the oxidation ditch does is to break down um, the, the, mostly the solids component in the wastewater. With that, we use an aerobic process, um, aerobic bacteria. And uh, so we have to put air into the water. Um, there's five turbo blowers at uh, the, the main plant. Um, and we have a fine bubble diffuser curtains in each of the two oxidation ditches. Uh, the three out of the five turbo blowers um, have failed. Uh, the actual blower still works, but there's a variable frequency drive that controls the motor, and this allows the fans to change speed um, to get the diffusers um, at, the, at the proper rate. So we have three out of the five that have failed, and um, the fourth one is showing signs of failure. And uh, so we need to order some parts is what we're doing here and um, get these parts into these uh, 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 turbo blowers. Uh, the turbo blowers are proprietary. Um, you can't just go to the hardware store and buy these parts. Um, so that's the reason for the sole sourcing is we need to go through AFSCO and um, to buy parts for the APG and Neuros uh, turbo blowers. And so that's what the sole source part of it. And then um, we're a little bit over the city manager's signing authority of $30,000 that you guys did some meetings ago. 
Um, we're at $32,000 uh, to fix these. Um, we are taking this out of our equipment repair line item. And um, so uh, this is something we need to do to keep our treatment processes uh, going. Um, in the future, um, I've talked to our finance director. Um, you know, everything has a life, whether it's an automobile or a turbo blower. And um, we're going to be working on some replacement schedules for some of our equipment at, at some of the factories, right? Um, that we need to be on that. Um, that, you know, we shouldn't be down three blowers right now. Um, that we should have just been rolling them out regularly. Um, that's the type of program I'm used to. Same thing with the pumps at the plants, too. That we need to invest in, in some newer pumps also. I'll be talking to you guys a little bit more about that at another time. But tonight we need to sole source uh, this particular vendor and uh, get the city manager authorized to uh, uh, sign for the procurement. Hmm. All right. Well, is there any public comment, Donna? No, Mr. Mayor. All right. Anybody have any questions for today? I'm just glad to I see. Have. I'm just glad to see that staff is continuing to be committed to asset management and looking forward at, at how to take care of what we have so that we can better serve our citizens. And I just very much appreciate the hard work of Jay and his team and finance and everyone involved to continue to move this forward. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think that there's an opportunity to further tell uh, the story about what we do as a city. And I know that we're in COVID times right now. And I think um, there, you know, we've got some students and whatnot that might um, make be willing to make some films or record, you know, what we do here in this plant. I don't think that you all get enough credit for what you operate there. So maybe there's an opportunity for us to film some of the stuff that we do and start putting videos out. Yeah, um, I actually worked on some of those programs when I was at Newburgh. Um, the wastewater end of the system is expensive and um, we need to promote ourselves and get information out to people about exactly what does it do. You know, you look at the discharge into the bay and uh, there's shellfish growers out there um, and we have some of the highest water quality uh, going out of our plant. And, uh, you know, due to Brent Armstrong and his team out there, are doing a great job uh, keeping us in compliance, um, keeping new parts going at that plant. It's an aging plant um, is key, right? You got to maintain your automobiles and everything else. Uh, this is no different. Um, so uh, yeah, kudos to the guys down there. And then also to our planning team, uh, Grant Osborne is working on the wastewater master plan update right now. I'm in weekly phone calls with PhD engineers about treatment processes and piping conveyance and pumping and that sort of thing. And uh, we have top notch consultants and staff. So uh, kudos to everybody. The other part I wanted to mention just to tag on to that is our Spotlight Shelton events uh, that we had planned and started and uh, now we're not all able to get together and talk about things like that. But that uh, those events are exactly the types of things that we want to use to uh, let people know what we actually do here uh, and invite them in to see the process. But when we can all get back together again and not stare, stare at each other through a Zoom screen, that is uh, definitely on the agenda. And Jay, I got a question for you. Yes, sir. Uh, how long have how long have these four uh, what do we call them blowers? been out yeah uh so i asked the same question um about a year and a half the first one failed and then the next one then the, th the third one was recent and so they they were backups um, the plant is designed um, for larger capacities, obviously. And so the first one or two wasn't a big deal to the crew, but when they lost right. the third one and then the fourth one started getting a little glitchy, it was like, you know, we need to do these now. 
And so in the future though, um, we know how many hours are on these particular types of machines and then uh, regular maintenance, you know, will define us just replacing parts that are worn at eight, worn at 80 or 90%. Um, another change I'm making at uh, the plants is uh, I'm, I'm talking to um, the union in the near future here about uh, moving uh, someone to a full-time uh, mechanics position. Um, right now, all the operators are doing the mechanic work. I'm used to having um, at least one senior mechanic, and that's her sole duty is to watch stuff like this and uh, be repairing these things, and you'll have an operations and maintenance plan. So I'll be working towards moving operator, a operator into an actual mechanic position and so we really have someone designated doing these type of things full-time yeah are they pretty much shot then i guess or can uh, you is the same thing happening to all of them yeah that's similar and so it's a variable variable frequency drive uh, the motors are still good and the uh the turbo blowers the fans and stuff are still good it's just one of the drive components um, that ramps them up and down is what we need to replace. It's a wear item. It, it's pretty common. Uh, they use BFDs also on pumps. And it, what it does, it allows you to change the speed of the pump or the fan. That's the failed component here. I see. So you can't rob Peter to pay Paul. You, you can't cannot. Rob okay. All right. Okay, staff recommends the council concur to move this item to the action agenda for the next meet, uh, November 3rd meeting. Good. All right. Next item on the business agenda is a resolution number 1179-1020 for Tyler Energa, Administrative Services Director Michelle Sutherland will give us more information. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council. Hopefully you can hear me just fine. Um, <clears throat> wonderful. Um, in order to address the strategic goals um, of the City Council, including accountable government, community life, and economic vitality, staff has reviewed various options to upgrade our technology services. Uh, the software services presented in the staff report discussed broadly will allow us to serve the development community more efficiently, track our assets in a cost efficient manner and prioritize maintenance activity and allow city staff to quickly engage with Shelton citizens and businesses on a wide variety of concerns through an integ integrated platform. All of these capabilities contribute to city employees creating an environment where city council strategic goals can be met. Uh, because Tyler Technologies currently provides our financial management software exclusive of the budgeting function, and because the city has a strong preference for a single software solution rather than systems from multiple providers, Tyler Technologies is the appropriate vendor to ensure seamless integration on new software. Further, due to time constraints applied to the CARES Act funding from Washington State Department of Commerce, adequate time to appropriately consider other potential vendors is not available. Um, what this will allow us to do is um, move our, with an aging um, network infrastructure that we currently have, um, it will allow us to move to a cloud-based system, um, utilize uh, new modules such as Energov for permitting, planning, um, doing online reviews um, and requests of that sort. Um, it has code enforcement uh, modules. Um, also, there's a citizen and uh, my 311. It actually allows citizens in the community to use either a desktop or their, their cell phone. Um, it's got um, a very nice, nice setup on the phone. If they see a pothole in the road or if they see a stop sign down, they can immediately go on and report that um, through the my 311. Um, the My Civic is actually a wonderful app. Um, it allows anyone to look up the city of Shelton and we can configure that um, however the council and staff would like to do that. It allows us to see um, different events in the area, um, different options for dining, different things of that sort, but also provides the citizens of Shelton with the ability to pay their utility bills online to contact um, a member of their staff just by using the wheelhouse on their, their cell phone. Um, along with that, um, there's an asset management system. 
um, which will allow us to keep better track of assets, maintenance, things of that sort, and that do work orders. Um, and also a utility billing module, again, to allow citizens to pay online. And that will also bring us into PCI compliance. So this uh, expenditure with a total cost of $137,671 will be paid from the city's general fund. CARES Act funding um, dollars will be utilized for $67,000 of that amount. And uh, staff requests the council concur to place resolution 1179-1020 on the November 3rd, 2020 action agenda. Uh, did anyone have any questions? I think I've asked this before. Is this leading us to B&O taxes online? Being able to do a B&O report online uh, and pay those taxes online? I think I've asked Jeff, but uh, I remember. <laughs> that, that is part of the I didn't hear a thing you said. <laughs> yeah, uh, Michelle, you locked up a little bit there, but yes, that is uh, what we're heading toward. We uh, want to be uh, a fully online environment um, uh, for those uh, uh, opportunities that people want to, even though <laughs> we'll still be available here in person. Uh, yes, it will allow us to be able to do that. Um, the, the implementation schedule, we need to be wise about how we schedule the implementation. So, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an upgrade to Michelle's uh, internet Did anyone uh, part of this as well. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> need to get her some fiber hood. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now you're muted, Michelle. <laughs> so I'm having terrible difficulty with signal this evening. Yeah, <laughs> I, to go to I think uh, I think we got an answer to the uh, question. Or are we? Mm -hmm. We good to go? Okay. All right. Any public comment, Donna? No, Mr. Mayor. All right. Anybody have any questions for Michelle? Okay, staff recommends the council concur to move this item forward to the action agenda for the November 3rd meeting. I think we're all good with that. All right. The last business item is a resolution number 1180-1020, the right systems statement of work and retainer. Michelle will share the details. If her I mic will. is working. Is it working? Yes. Wonderful. So um, again, with uh, this resolution for right systems, um, it's addressing the strategic goals of the city council for accountable government, community life, and economic vitality um, in upgrading our technology services. Um, the right system statement of work and retainer provides the city with the opportunity and capability to migrate seamlessly to a cloud-based computing environment, negating the need to maintain and upgrade in-house services and associated components such as HVAC systems. The cloud-based services will also enable most city employees to work remotely and still provide services expected by the citizens and businesses of Shelton. All of these capabilities contribute to city employees creating an environment where city council systems incorporated currently provides information technology support to the city of Shelton and because the city has a strong preference for a single support vendor rather than multiple vendors to ensure seamless communication right systems is the appropriate vendor to ensure a seamless integration on new software again due to time constraints applied to the CARES Act funding from the state of Washington, um, adequate time to appropriately consider other potential vendors is not available. Um, the expenditure has a total cost of $350,621, of which $76,551 um, will be CARES Act funded. 
um, looking at our aging um, infrastructure if you would like to, but we got many pieces of equipment purchased between 2008 and 2010 um, that are Age. We have one that is past its cycle of life and, and other um, pieces of equipment and servers that are really coming to the end of their life cycle. So moving in this direction, um, we believe is an excellent move for the city and staff requests that the council concur to place resolution 1180-1020 on the November 3rd action agenda. All right, thank you, Michelle. And did anyone have any questions? Any questions for Michelle? Any public comment, Donna? No, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Staff recommends the council concur to move this item to the action agenda for the November 3rd meeting. Okay. Yep. The first action item presented by Community Development Director Mark Ziegler has to do with the Civic Center Rotating Art Gallery recommendations. Mark, you're still here. I'm here. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. I'm pleased to bring you tonight the latest recommendation from the Shelton Arts Commission for placement in the Civic Center Rotating Art Gallery. Uh, the Arts Commission called for artists with a deadline of October 2nd. Eight artists submitted work for consideration. The Arts Commission met on October 20th to jury those those uh, pieces submitted. Uh, seven artists were selected with a total of 21 pieces of art this time. Uh, you will see from the pictures that some of the art is three-dimensional that will go in the cabinet at the top of the stairs in, as well as the wall between municipal court and the police department. And with your approval, the art will be start up, installed, excuse me, on November 3rd and in place through January 29th, 2021. Okay. Any public comment? No, Mr. Mayor. All right. Do we have a motion then? Let's see. I move to approve move. the Shelton Art Commission recommendations for placement in the Civic Center Rotating Art Gallery. Second. Okay. We have a motion and a second. Um, we have a motion and a second to approve the Shelton Arts Commission's recommendations for placement in the Civic Center Rotating Art Gallery. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. The last item on the action agenda is LTAC grant recommendations. City Clerk Donna Nault will share the information with us. A point of personal privilege. Before we enter into LTAC discussions, I'm going to recuse myself from this conversation um, because I do work at the chamber, which is one of the applicants for today. So, Donna, if you would please text me on my city phone or um, con give me a quick call when you're ready. I'll return to the room in the meantime. I will be off and away. Okay, bye. Thank you. Give me just a sec to find Deidre here on my phone. Okay, Mr. Mayor and council members, um, nothing has changed on this report from the last meeting. This is the LTAC grant recommendations. Um, there are two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven different grants that are being offered and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Anyone have any questions? If not, well, is there any public comment? There's no public comment, Mr. Mayor. Okay. Um, do we have a motion? I move to accept the LTAC grant applications, recommendations as presented. Second. All right, we have a motion and a second. Before I go any farther, Jeff, do you think I should recuse myself from this? 
Uh, no, Mr. Mayor, I don't uh, think so in this particular instance. Okay. We have a motion and a, sec and a second to accept the LTAC grant recommendations as presented. All in favor say aye. 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 All aye. Opposed? All opposed? No? And comment again, if these if these events don't happen due to COVID related issues or any other issues, they're not expended. That's correct. 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 Okay. Correct. We have made a few changes this year. So and then uh, same, uh, I have a comment as well, and that is that if we are able to support as a city, you know, um, outdoor events that, you know, um allow us to gather without you know being a, a vector <laughs> of you know infections and whatnot for covid um i'm full support in how we can you know um you know if there's a way for us to have christmas town usa again you know it, i think it's going to be real important for us to be able to celebrate that in the safest way possible yeah absolutely i think uh, absolutely. everybody's on the, the same page with that i'm i'm i have my fingers crossed and i hope uh, that can happen All right. maybe we need to prep that parking lot a little bit sooner <laughs> so it's flat. <laughs> okay we'll move along to uh mr jeff knighton will you give us your city manager report so wait you, for De wait for deidre oh, we gotta get right. deidre back Yep. Yes. Sorry, Donna. I sent her a message, so I'm sure okay. she's coming. <clears throat> there she there is. There she is. Y'all okay, Deidre, we're asking for Jeff's manager report. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor, uh, Deputy Mayor, members of council. Uh, tonight, I really wanted to focus on our recruitment for our new police chief. And I'm uh, very happy to report. Uh, last time we reported, we had 16 applicants and we're interviewing eight. And I want to express my uh, thanks and gratitude for the community panel that helped us select finalists from those eight. Um, they spent uh, two days here, um, most of two days here, uh, including uh, a couple of our council members, council member Inesco and council member McDowell, along with uh, community partners from uh, Sierra Pacific and from uh, Peninsula Credit Union, uh, along with our YMCA. So we're uh, really thankful for that. Oh, uh, and uh, Chief Burdett from the city of Bremerton. I was uh, very grateful that he came down to help us select these finalists. Um, we have three finalists that uh, I will be interviewing this week, uh, along with a community panel uh, or a community open house uh, tomorrow, starting at four o'clock. Each of the candidates will have a half an hour to answer questions from the community, those that have signed up. Um, we have uh, several people that have signed up to ask questions and happy to have that community participation. This is new to all of us. Typically when uh, you do a recruitment like this, you have a open house. It's uh, uh, much uh, uh, more public involvement. Uh, although we are trying to get as much public involvement as we can uh, in this process while we're dealing with COVID-19 and all the restrictions on gathering. Uh, so I would uh, ask people that are interested to fill out our feedback form after they've watched the open house tomorrow um, the community members that are invited have already been selected, uh, but that will be available on our website and on uh, Mason Web TV, I'm sure, uh, to watch at your convenience. And please fill out the feedback form. We'd love to hear what you have to say uh, as you um, as you go through these uh, these candidates. So with that, I'm going to share my screen. We did ask the candidates to produce a video for us uh, with uh, three questions and just introduce themselves to the community. Uh, I will hit play on the screen and uh, once all three have gone, um, uh, we will be uh, ready to move forward and I think that will conclude my briefing, but I'll, uh, I'll definitely come back and say good night to you all. <laughs> Hold on just a second. Uh, 
Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah. All right, so. Hello everyone, my name is Carol Beeson. Thank you for this opportunity to introduce myself. I am coming to you from my hometown of Poway, California, which kind of looks like and I've been having problems downloading to you from my everything, so I'll try again. California, which kind of looks like it could be in Washington. I've been a member of the San Diego Police Department now for 25 years, um, and my experience has made me a bit of a jack of all trades. I've worked five out of our nine patrol divisions, and I have specialized investigative experience in narcotics, vice, sex crimes, child abuse, and internal affairs. I've also had the opportunity to work in community engagement assignments to include a juvenile services team where we work closely with our community to reduce violence against juveniles in our, in our community. Um, I also work on our homeless outreach team where we work with our community partners and resource providers to help people end their homelessness permanently. I also served as the mental health liaison for the department and I worked with hospitals and mental health facilities to help improve the way our officers interacted with people that were, were suffering from mental crisis. When I joined the police department back in 1995, I had an associate's degree in liberal arts. While working, I went back to school and I got my bachelor's degree in social science from Chapman University. And I recently completed my master's degree in law enforcement and public safety leadership from the University of San Diego. When I'm not doing my regular day job, I also teach report writing to the new recruits at the Regional Police Academy. I'm sure you're wondering why someone who lives in San Diego would want to move to Shelton. Earlier this year, my husband retired after serving the San Diego Police Department for 33 years. Next month, I will also be eligible to retire if I choose. My husband's ready to ride off into the sunset, but I still feel like I have more to contribute. So we saw the job announcement for Shelton uh, and were immediately intrigued. Um, my husband has always dreamed of retiring to an evergreen forest. So we immediately started looking at Google to figure out uh, if Shelton would be the kind of place where we would want to live. And we both fell in love with your town. It looks like the kind of place where a Hallmark Christmas movie should be filmed. I think I'd be a great fit for Shelton because not only do I have a great deal of varied law enforcement experience, but I grew up in a small town in Ohio. Um, if I were to be selected to be your chief, uh, I wouldn't be trying to make you into San Diego. Quite the contrary, I'd be committed to your vision, your mission, and your values. As you can see, I am very committed to the law enforcement agencies that I serve, as I've been with San Diego for the past 25 years. If I were to be selected to be the new chief at the Shelton Police Department, this would be my last department. I am so excited about coming to visit Shelton later on in the week, and I look forward to getting a chance to meet all of you in person when I get there. Thank you very much for your time. My name is Mark Bass, and I'd like to spend the next few minutes introducing myself to you. I was born in Vietnam. Uh, we came to America in 1975 when I was uh, seven years old. Three days later, they bombed Saigon. Talk about getting out of the war zone in the nick of time. Uh, I've been married for 29 years. My wife is an elementary school principal. We have two adult children. They are both in uh, education as well. I started my law enforcement career in high school as a police cadet. Um, then I became a community service officer after graduating from high school. I attended a police academy in 1988-89. I became a police officer in 1990 with the David Police Department. Uh, that uh, continued, uh, my law enforcement con career continued for 28 years. Uh, I worked at three different departments, Davis PD, Fairfield PD, and Vallejo PD. 
I ended up uh, retiring at Davis PD in uh, 2018 as a deputy police chief. During my law enforcement career, I had the opportunity to work in different uh, assignments. Um, I was a patrol and motor officer. I was on a SWAT team. I was a use of force instructor. Uh, I was a dare officer. Then I promoted to sergeant. As a sergeant, I worked in patrol, investigation, and traffic. I was supervised a countywide DUI task force uh, while with traffic. I was also the field training coordinator and a crisis hostage team leader. And then I promoted to lieutenant. And as a lieutenant, I uh, oversaw the patrol division. Um, I was also I became the crisis hostage negotiator commander and later became the assistant uh, SWAT commander. I also work professional standards, which is uh, involved um, internal affairs, uh, the PIO, hiring, training, and recruiting. Then I promoted to deputy chief. Uh, the deputy chief, I worked both sides of the house. I worked uh, uh, the operations side, which is patrol records, investigations, and communica communication center. And then as a the administration side, I worked with professional standards, uh, which is higher training, recruiting, terminations, and evidence department, primary analysts, and volunteers. Um, I have a bachelor's of uh, science degree in occupational studies from Cal State Long Beach. I'm also a graduate of Close Command College. Uh, my leadership style is, I believe in servant leadership. I believe that it's not about me, it's about serving others. It's about training others up and helping them uh, grow in their career uh, as police officers. I uh, believe in being a resource to others. Um, and uh, I also believe in lead by example. Um, accountability is huge for me. Uh, I expect that of myself and others. Uh, mentorship, I believe hugely in mentoring, uh, being a mentor myself and mentoring others. Uh, to becoming future leaders in uh, police organizations. So why Shelton? Uh, I know Chief Moody, uh, he and I used to work together at Fairfax PD back in the day. He is leaving a department in good shape as he will be an easy transition for the new incoming chief. Um, after he speaks highly of the city and of the police department, I, I believe that uh, uh, there's room for improvement and opportunity for growth, and I'll explore those areas as uh, a chief. Um, I believe my 30 years of law enforcement career uh, in working in different agencies, you know, ranging from 60 to 125 plus officers, my different assignments, uh, my promotions as preparing for this position. Uh, my biggest asset is my ability to relate with people and get along well with people of uh, different ages and from different backgrounds. Um, I believe it's a calling of mine to serve others. I believe I was, I was created to serve other people and help other people uh, whatever needs they have. Uh, the Shelton community is no other, different than other communities. We have the same needs and wants in your police department as other communities do. I believe that my uh, policing style fits the needs of the Shelton Police Department. Uh, thank you for your time. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Schaub. I'm one of the finalists for your chief of police position. And I wanted to take a few minutes and just tell you a little bit more about my background, my experience, and my training, and why I would be a great fit for your department. I started with the Pierce County Sheriff's Department in 1994, and I've been with that agency for 26 years. I've spent a, a lot of time doing a variety of assignments from patrol and investigations to schools, to field training work, to search and rescue, to marine services. I've got a real breadth of experience in basic patrol functions and investigations. I promoted to sergeant in 2007, and in 2010, I was selected by the town of Stillicum to be their next director of public safety. I was in charge of both the police department and the fire department. I served the town for five years and uh, transitioned over to Pierce Transit and was their public safety chief for Pierce Transit Police for three years. I came back to the uh, to the mothership, the sheriff's office, uh, a little over two years ago, where I currently am banning one of the brand new positions in the department. It's called the programs lieutenant position. 
where I'm in charge of all the non-patrol programs for the uh, department. Uh, I have everything from crime suppression, crime analysis, uh, traffic, community liaison deputies, school resource officers, code enforcement, animal control, and our brand new program, which is the uh, mental health co-responder program. I've also got a master's degree in public administration from the University of Washington, an undergraduate degree in history from Central Washington University, and I attended the 252nd session of the FBI National Academy back in Quantico, Virginia. Uh, why is now a good time? Why is Shelton a good fit? Uh, I personally, I've, I've been in a big department my entire career, except for my stints in Stoic and, and Pierce Transit. And the thing that I, I found that I enjoyed about the smaller departments is the sense of intimacy, the sense of connection to the community and, and Shelton and this department fits that, uh, that sense of intimacy and the connection to the community. Um, why now? For the first time in 20 years, Pierce County will have a brand new sheriff. Uh, I backed uh, several candidates, but it is likely that uh, if, uh, if the, the most well-known of all the candidates uh, is successful in his bid to become the next Pierce County Sheriff. Uh, I've already been told I'm not gonna be part of their command staff. And so I'm looking in the last eight to 10 years of my career to be able to go out and do work that I really enjoyed. I found that being both a Sergeant and a Chief, the most fulfilling work I've ever had a chance to be engaged in, because I love building high performing teams. I love building a great work environment and I love delivering you know, quality excellent service to the public. And I see that opportunity in Shelton. I've had a chance to meet uh, the town staff, had a chance to meet the city administrator and the chief. And I have to say that putting together a promotional recruitment process using virtual technologies, they did a fantastic job. And you the citizenry should be proud of the work that they did. Uh, you know, and finally, I would say that is why am I a great fit? I've done the work of being a chief before. It's fun work, it's hard work, it's challenging work. Uh, I'm a known commodity. I've done that work for eight years. Uh, my, my current assignment, I have 50 employees and about $7 million with a budget. I have a proven track record of, uh, of making the workplaces and the work environments that I've been involved in, places that people love to work for me, uh, I'm fair, and I, and I would be honored to be, uh, to be your next chief of police. So, uh, all right, let's call this study session of whoops, October 6, 2020 to order. That's an what order. is going on? <laughs> that's a, that's no, a, <laughs> we're all going backwards. Are, that's are a, we starting over? You gotta love the YouTube auto forward. Yes, the oh, autoplay uh, the auto play caught me. I didn't get it quite. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, uh, I wanted to let you all. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to uh, let you all see those videos. They're all up on our website now, uh, along with uh, the synopsis of each of the candidates under the, the uh, next police chief search. Um, we will uh, meet those folks in person tomorrow via, well, via Zoom uh, and for the opportunity to ask questions, as I mentioned before. And uh, I'm glad we had such an outstanding group of candidates and uh, we definitely had a, a great pool to choose from. So uh, with these three, we'll narrow it down to one with the hopeful, uh, or with the intent rather, of announcing our new police chief uh, first week in November. I happy to answer any questions if you have any. No, no questions, um, but uh, those, those three candidates are, I've read through their, uh, their packages and then the videos. Um, I really liked um, the work that um, Ms. Rickard did putting that all together on our website and comprehensively kind of putting things together for the public to be able to review. I think it's a really kind of innovative way of doing the um, community panel and you're exactly right. Typically these things widely attended by the public and, and looked at, especially right now with everything going on in the world. This is a very high profile position within city government and in the community and in the, you know, in the joint partner, joint jurisdictional areas that Shelton Police Department supports. But there are three leaders there, um, you know, uh, and I'm, I'm impressed that uh, we, we um, they're interested in, in Shelton and 
the professionalism again that we said it a bunch of times tonight but that the leadership team in the city sets forth is creating a, an environment that people want to work there you know people want to work here people want to relocate and um they want to move to shelton that's the that's exactly what we want and um exactly. I'm, I'm i'm extremely proud of everything that's happened in the past couple of years um under your leadership so thank you very much for all that and i'm excited to find a new chief here Yeah, I think he has a tough choice to make. Why do we have so many panels? <laughs> so if we are done, our next meeting will be Tuesday, November 3rd, 2020 at six o'clock. First time we've done that in a while. <laughs> so this, yeah, meeting, this meeting is adjourned at 737. Good night. Thank you. Eric, we